All right, cool. All right, we're live, fellas. All right, we'll get started. Appreciate you guys taking the time. I know, Ray, you've had a crazy week up in Mansfield. I know you got your tournament going on, so I appreciate you stepping away for a little bit. Uh, same to you, Lupe. I know you're busy at work. And then everyone else for jumping on. Uh, rules engagement, real quick. If you have any questions, just type it in the comment for, for uh, any of us, and I'll navigate through those. The main topic today, we're going to be talking about low major kids um, all the way down through, you know, D3, D2, JUCO, NIA, because we did discuss a lot about Division One high major kids. And we know we don't have a ton of those here. So a lot of parents had reached out to me asking, you know, the process and educate parents and coaches, anybody else listening on the process, how it works for those academic kids and how they can get monies and that stuff. But before we do dive in, I did want to start, I went back today and listened to part one. There's a lot of meat in that. So I um, enjoyed going back, listening to our conversation. We discussed not having any live periods during July. I know on the boys' side, it's been pretty quiet. Uh, Lupe is going to touch on the live stream, what they did, which was something really positive. But the girls have been rolling as far as tournaments. Um, me and Lupe did talk offline. So, Ray, you may be able to help us with this. They're not live peers, but are they being streamed? I know you've got your, you've had your tournament. You've got another one coming up. You're up at Mansfield for the premier one. Let us know what's going on with the girls' side as far as AAU, because it's a lot different when we talked on part one. We thought everything was shut down, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So I'll let you open with that. Yeah, we opened up uh, in July, um, actually June, I want to say June 2021, um, were the first weekends. I had my extravaganza that weekend, and uh, I know of a dozen kids at my event that got offers from live stream. I know it's uh, difficult with the college coaches right now, um, ascertaining intangibles. You know, it's hard to see the extras, but video don't lie in regards to the athleticism and, and being able to put the ball in a hole. So coaches are doing the best job they can. I saw a tweet from uh, one of the better recruiting coordinators in the country saying, pray for them because they have it tough right now. A lot of uh, live stream services aren't the best, but they're doing the best they can. We just came from Mansfield, personally had a couple kids get some offers from that. I know a ton of offers came from that event because it was pretty loaded as well. Thanks, thanks, Ray. Uh, Lupe, let us know what's going on with the with the boys as well. Not a whole lot of stuff, but you you can talk about your live stream event, which was extremely positive. Anything else that you're hearing? And I mean, I, I, everything I'm, feedback I'm getting is, you know, we weren't like not going to have no live events for grassroots, right? I mean, they might push something into October for the Scholastic, which means you get to play in events uh, that are live with your high school team. The college coaches get to come. And the biggest pushback I'm hearing right now from the NABC and, and everybody involved is that those those staffs don't want to send their coaches on the road, right? That's kind of their concern is, is sending those coaches on the road, their age, the areas they're going into is, you know, there's some hot spots, there's some spots that are, you know, they're walking free and, and, and not as uh, unfortunately hot beds as, as Texas, Florida, and Arizona are currently, according to the media, right? Whatever, whatever however you want to spend that. So, man, I'm, I'm hedging to say hard that we're not going to have anything live. I'll be honest with you from the boys' side. So you're starting to see a lot more streaming events and, and people doing live streams. And, and um, it's, it's it's kind of piggybacking off Ray. It's it's successful. It is. It's it's the best we can do. And it's the times we're living in. So you either got to adapt to the times or you can get left behind. Left behind. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Lupe, tell everybody. I know a lot of people watch, but for ones that didn't, tell us the, how the idea came up, the process behind it. And, the live stream and how much success you had with that um, with your hard work teams and I think it was Kuzali and uh, Strength of Motion. It was so man honestly it came together really fast the week before I kind of just uh, when when I realized we weren't going to have anything live I said we got to be some for our kids in a contained environment that can be safe so I reached out to PJ Kuzi from Kuzali uh, he brought his 17U team we had our 16s our 17Us uh, strength and motions prep team. And then we had a group of uh, former overseas pros and, and division one players, Caputi and a couple of his guys put a team together of grown men, right? You can call them grown ass elite. And, uh, you know, we, it was really, it was great, man. We had over 3000 views on Silverways Media, which is Ryan Silver's platform, which broke his record. We had the 2100 the first day, uh, had over a hundred coaches on. I mean, the feedback was amazing. It was, it was just quick and to the point. So what we did is we did 10 minute scrimmages, uh, you know, no free throws until the last minute, got the games going. A lot of these kids haven't had the chance to go up and down in some areas they're in. So the last thing we wanted to do is it's to get sloppy. As Ray knows, coaches' attention spans are that of a fly. So kind of the, the get them in, get them out, get them in, get them out worked out really well. Uh, and we had significant feedback from coaches with kids. And, you know, I don't really kind of tally who've been offered and who hasn't based off of that. 
but just the feedback was amazing. And, you know, coaches asking when are you doing it again? And we did it for free, right? So we didn't charge. It wasn't for us to uh, try to make any money off the event. Uh, it, it really wasn't geared for that and it wasn't structured that way. But uh, the feedback was amazing. The kids liked it. Uh, the coaches liked it. Even the parents uh, that were watching. Uh, it's probably something that we'll do every year. It's not the business I'm getting in, and I don't plan on doing it, you know, once a month or anything like that. But I do probably plan to do that every year, uh, even when they go back to live events, because it was such a success. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Ray, any any thoughts on you possibly doing something for on the girl side? Yeah, not really. I mean, it's different. You know, I'm I'm somewhat compared to Lupe, um, club wise, but. You know, the format that we're allowed to do right now, you take uh, players first. My man Devon over there who does a terrific job. I know uh, he's your partner, a terrific skill set guy. He got some really good up and comers. Um, you look at the event he's playing in this weekend where he's playing some of the top kids in the state. His kids are going to get put on the map. They're going to be seen by hundreds of coaches. Um, yes, I can go out and, and, and grab a Sci-Fair Elite and do what, you know, Luke did with Coos because that's the beautiful thing. And by the way, I went. I loved it. I'm a fan. I'm a basketball fan at heart. And it was kind of neat to see what uh, Lupe and Boomer were able to do with that. But um, I don't have a need to do that because um, we're throwing tournaments. You know, we you, know, you can be seen if you're an under-the-radar program at my event and thank God we have events and we're going through the safety precautions. We won't get into all those in this short time frame, but we have no need to do a, a live scrimmage like that because um, we have such a big venue at the event. And kind of piggybacking off that Mark real quick, in fairness, I have four committed kids, you know, and uh, one of my kids, I mean, I've got two, they're not in one is, you know, uh, is awesome. He's a 2022. So he, he's fine. He's got another year. So my sense of urgency to do a lot of stuff isn't as apt as, as many other people around the country, right? Because I'm just in a different position. I just really am. And the 16 still have another year. So I've, I've got to kind of, my view is going to be different than Ray. So Ray's doing, he's doing the right thing. He's doing it the right way. And he's right, man. He's going to pull teams that without him and having this tournament this weekend, I guarantee there's, there's going to be some teams with kids that never get those offers or opportunities if he doesn't have this event and doesn't get streaked. Hey, hey, Mark, hold on. Let me just interject. I, I wasn't – I hope I didn't come off wrong in regards to what Lupe did. Again, if I was in that position on the boys' side, I would do the same. But I don't have a need to is what I was trying to say. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got that. Um, all right. So, I know the main topic today is going to be we're talking about low major kids or Division two, Division three, JUCOs, NIA. Um, either one of you can go first. Just explain the process, how that works. I think um, – Again, educating parents, maybe some coaches on here as well. You guys, I know you have a lot of high major kids, but you also have some Division II kids, some three kids, some NIA kids, and JUCO kids. Explain the process in best way you can to help understand how that how that works for listeners. We want to go first. Go ahead, Luke. You go, Luke. Uh, you know we do. We've we've. I mean, I've got. I think I put one. Norm Beckford, I have one kid go Division Two. I should have two kids go Division Two last year, right? And I've had some low majors and, and NAI kids before. I mean, I think the I think the player and his play determines the level. Of but we don't, as as club directors and coaches, you know, um, we have honest conversations. At least I do with kids. You know, I've, I've had one particular kid who was who was in a Division Two setting, waiting on a Division One scholarship, and I said it's not going to come. You, you need to take the scholarship. And I sat down with his family, explained why, and the explanations were. He was a long athletic wing who didn't have the skill set to play at a low major Division One, and he didn't have a Division One offer. And we're talking about we are in, man, I want to say August or September of, of, of last summer. So they're not going to come. And if they are, it's going to be a place he probably doesn't want to be at, and he's going to be somebody's last option, which means you're first, probably the first option out the next season if you don't perform in quick. And I think that the truth needs to be told to a lot of these kids and parents. If, if the opportunity is there at a low major or an NAIA or Division II, it's still free school, man. That's where they don't – that's where they, they just don't get it. It's still free. They still eat for free. They still get to play games. Some of them, everything's live streamed, right? It's, it's, it's still the basketball experience at the next level that you can get away out of it debt-free. But just explaining to them that, man, sometimes that phone call is not going to come. And it's hard to have those conversations, but if you have them early enough in the process, 
to explain to parents when you first start getting into it that these are the levels and throughout the process I'm going to educate you on where I think your kid is at on the level and at the end of the day I can't make that phone ring the players play their DNA and the outcome of their performance makes those phones ring from that particular level whether it's high major or juco or division two agreed uh, Ray anything to add to it um absolutely I agree wholeheartedly um I think the biggest thing on our side is the three S's, you know, with size, you know, speed or and or athleticism and skill. Um, if you're missing one of those, it's hard to go P5 if you don't have size, speed or skill. Um, I think over here it's obviously easier with 15 scholarships, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, a lot of kids can go sit on a P5 bench in female basketball that would be mid-majors if it was guys with their 12 scholarships. I think guys are different in that sometimes you have a growth spurt. Um, you know, five, six inches in college. Guys that typically can grow later, you know, stereotyping. And then the same thing with the skill set. What I noticed when I went to Tech was is there's not a lot of time for skill set. Um, in a lot of women's basketball programs. I'm not painting them with a broad brush, but a lot of times when you have practice um, 50 hours a week with academics, you don't see a lot of females getting in the gym at 2 in the morning like we did with the guys. I would consistently see guys still getting in the gym. So on the guy side, you can have a mid-major who adds to the skill set to become a high major. That's not the case typically on the female side. You take a kid like Sophia Ramos. I thought she was under-recruited. Um, yes, she could have went P5. She's shining at her level. And like Lupe talked about, go where you can eat and play from day one. That's the right choice to make. But she could have sat on a P5 bench. She was just not recruited at that level. Has she gotten better? Typical progress. But the way she's shooting it, the way she's handling her IQ, that was the same as it was in, in high school. Obviously, the body's matured, but you are what you are, I would say, um, for the most part by your sophomore, junior year on the female side. And I don't know if that's the case on the guy side. And that's the problem on our side. If you're not being recruited by P5s as a sophomore, junior, and you're not 6'2 or above, it's probably not going to happen by and large. So people just need to understand their lane. Run your lane, work your deal, and you know I always talk about it. Yeah, we got some all stars, but our best players, the ones that have contributed the most to the college programs, aren't at the P five level. Agreed. Um, Lupe, you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, and, and Ray brought up some really good points. I probably didn't answer that correctly, as is from an individual standpoint. Is on the boys' side, man, you have to do one, you have to be a lead at one thing to be a P five kid or P seven, right? We, you know, we consider seven power conferences with with the Big East and the and the uh, AC, uh, AAC American Conference. So you have to be elite at something that translates to that level, right? So you have a lot of tweeners, right? And when we have a lot of tweeners here in the city where you don't know if the kid's a one or he's a two and everybody says, oh man, he's a one, but or he's a two or you know he's an undersized four. We have a lot of undersized kids here. So you have to be super elite in one thing. And like Ray says, and you gotta be skilled. And that's at all the levels. You'll see a lot of kids that are athletic and it's like, man, he's athletic, but he has no skill set. I mean, how many kids have you seen, Mark, from, you know, that are, their athletes can jump out of the gym. I mean, they're, you know, they make the all airport team. They look great in the layup line and they can't dribble. They can't shoot. They don't understand the concept. So most of those kids that are got end up at a Juco or in an NAIA that plays fast because they, you know, it's just kind of, and, and I'm not getting NAIA by any means, but it's an opportunity for them because they're so athletic, they can get away from their lack of skill set at that level. At the P5 or P7 level, the high major, even the mid-major level, you can't get away with that because they're all just as athletic. They're all just as fast. They all just jump as high. And if you don't have no skill set or do anything elite, then you're in trouble. And that's when the notches start falling off. And here's another hey, on the boy side. I'm not sure on the girl side. A low major kid can guard a high major kid. That's where there's a lot of misconception. The problem is that low major can't do a lot of things skill set wise that the high major can. But a low major kid can guard a high major kid. And that's where a lot of things I think things get convoluted in, in in parents' minds. Oh man, my kid shut this kid down or whatever the case is. No, he did a good job guarding him. But what he does on the other end doesn't translate, so he'll never see the floor. 
Lou, Red uh, let, let me <laughs> totally. And, and just coming out of Dallas, I think a lot of those kids in the Dallas area guard at a P5 level, whether their offensive skill set is mid major or D2. And it's not just Dallas, but athletes can guard uh, surely at a higher level than their offensive production. And then intangibles. I know we touched on this a little bit in the past, or at least in the other, um, the, the other interview, but are you going to be a good teammate? Will you be? Are you mentally tough enough to contribute to a program? Can you sit on the bench and wait your turn? Those are the type of things I think some people don't realize, uh, especially parents, is that my kid's scoring 40 a game. Yeah, but you acting up, she acting up, she always arguing with the ref, she's always beefing, fighting. You're showing the immaturity that's showing the P5 coach that, hey, first of all, I got big-time six-figure salary. I'm not going to take a chance on this kid and or the parent. And then the other part of that is, is she is she going to be a poison? I'd rather take someone who is just a little bit less talented knowing that she's going to buy in to help me keep my six-figure job. And I think on the boys' side, it's a little different because there's so much more money involved that, you know, their talent equals tolerance. So there's certain coaches that know how to deal with those type of players and parents because they can kind of massage it enough to keep those seven-figure salaries. It's a little different on the boys' side from that perspective. No, no, so no, 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 Luke. Lou, Luke, I'm, I'm, bro. What I'm saying is the borderline. Oh, border, my bad. The my kid bad. that, I yeah, that. I ain't talking. I ain't talking. Zion, Zion can <laughs> rob the bank, and we gonna let him play. <laughs> my bad. I, no, I I'm talking that borderline. Part. You're right. No, no, you're yeah. absolutely right on that. I missed that part. My bad, Ray. My bad. My bad. All right. Here, here's an add-on question I got for y'all. So. The, when do these conversations, and it could be different based on individuals, right? But when does the conversation start? Who does it start with? Does it start with the parents? Does it start with the individual, the kid? And then, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to bring it out there. Are you going based on what you're hearing from college coaches? Or are you going based on what you feel about the kid? For example, you may feel that that kid is a Division two kid but you're hearing from coaches that they are not. There may be a JUCO or an IA kid. What, how does that conversation start? I'm, I'm sure you guys have had those conversations. Does it start early? Um, and I know every situation is different, but just kind of talk us through how you deal with those situations. I think it's fluid, Mark. At least for me, it is, right? It, it does start early. And I do reach out to where I think the level the kid is. And everybody wants to start where? Division one, right? Mm -hmm. And so I reach out to, I think the kid's a borderline low major division two kid, which I've had several of those. And I have conversations. I said, what is it going to take for you guys to offer? Him? What do you want to see? I want to see A, B, and C, whether, you know, he needs to be able to handle it better. His IQ is not very good. I don't know what position he is. You hear a lot of that tweener stuff, right? Can he guard the position that we want him to play at, right? I want to see some of that. So I have those explanations to the kid. I said, hey, man, if you, this, you start showing this, this, and that, you're not going to probably have an opportunity to play at this level. But they'll take you here at Division Two, so you've got a free ride. You're good, you know. But if you want to get to this standpoint, you're gonna to have to go put the work in outside of even what we do. So it's those conversations, and it becomes fluid, man. We've had kids that were projected high majors end up low majors. We've had low major dudes end up high major kids or mid major, whatever the case may be. And then some kids get there and they transfer, and you know how that goes. But it's I think it's fluid for us on the boys' side because growth spurts, right? Uh, some kids are athletic early and everybody passes them up. Distractions. I mean, there's so many variables involved. So I think from our side, it, it becomes fluid. Uh, but it is a moving target. And it's one of those where I just keep informing the kid, this is where you're at. And you're not going to see yourself improve if I still see him, him stay stagnant. Great. Absolutely. It, it's fluid on this side as well. You know, we're in the business of helping kids chase dreams. So we in there, you know, you're seven, eight years old. Everybody can go to our equivalent, which is UConn or Baylor or Stanford. You know, on the guy's side is North Carolina, whatever, Duke. So, yes, to a seven-year-old, you can go to UConn. Um, you don't tell a 17-year-old that, you know. You know, as the game, you know, as time starts to go by, you start to really start reeling it in the ex expectations. And you, it's a teaching moment. You know, I know it's the same over there with Lupe. Um, we're constantly telling you what you need to do to keep chasing that dream to go to UConn or wherever it may be. Um, as you get older and you're not fulfilling 
um, those requirements, we're going to let you know to go ahead and adjust your expectations. But it's just some no-brainers on our side. God willing, people stay healthy. You take a, a L.A. sneeze, you know. You talk to three S's, size, speed, size for the a position, speed, athleticism, and her culture. She's planted in the right soil and her mother and her father and, 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 and plays for a good club. She's a no-brainer at that level. Uh, Nalissa Smith, those kids are no-brainers. The other ones, you know, you may not have the type of support system. Um, I love what Lupe says as far as DNA being undefeated. That's huge. You take his baby. His baby is one of, and I'm not saying that's because I'm on this interview with him, but one of the best on-ball defenders I've ever coached at her age. Her instincts are terrific. But look at the DNA. You know, mom's a track Olympian, you know, damn near. So on-ball, she damn near can get to the Division One level just on that and her ability to lock up anybody that's in front of her to what the jump pass length. Now, if she spent as much time on basketball as she did on track, now we're talking P five because the DNA and the culture is undefeated. I agreed. I, I went back and did, like I said, I listened to uh, to our first uh, interview that we had and we, uh, Lupe touched and I think you did Ray about parents, about the, you got to have, um, parents that support what you do and and let let you do what you want to do. So let's talk about because I know there's some parents on here that may not or parents that we know of that are telling their kids something different. So that's why I wanted to start with that, right? So for instance, Lupe said uh, he reached out to a coach. Where do you see this kid? You know, you guys have an idea where you think they are. They could be in between, and then the few years that could change based on whatever from many different aspects. But then they go, you know, they get in the car, they go home, and mom and dad are telling them, "No, I don't care if they uh, they think you're a D two kid, you're a D one kid." That's where the problems start. So you hope you don't have those parents, right? You hope you have the parents that that respect what you do and stay out the way. But we know that's not going to happen because. Parents are with their kid more than anybody. They may respect what you do in the gym for an hour or two hours or a weekend, but they get in the car. Now it's, it's my time, and especially from the, from the parents that are, that are play basketball, right? The ones that had maybe have played college or have some understanding. Um, I like what Lupe said with, um, with, with his daughter. He, he has all the, the tools to put his daughter at once, but he don't want to deal with it. I'm going to send him, send her to Ray. But I don't think we have enough of that. How do we change the culture maybe, or how do you deal with those parents or do you talk to the kid? We understand your parent is, says this, but we need you to do this. How, how do y'all fight those? Because I know that's an uphill battle for you guys and for every other program that's out there, coaches that are listening. Lupe, can I take this first? Go ahead, bro. So a few years ago, and, and again, this is my reputation, and it's a bad reputation with many, but it's worked for me. I had a kid, dad, who – uh I love dearly to this day. We're close. I won't tell you what his position is with me now. I heard him fat mouthing um, about how I was starting a kid over his kid. So I, I start, and Lupe can attest to this, I have talking points at the beginning of every practice, just like a college practice. And most of the time, I'm not talking to the kid. I'm talking to the parents. When you walk in my gym, parents are on one side, players on the other. You got to be quiet in my gym. We got a culture. This is not your time. And I'm going to talk to your kid about why you didn't play, why I yanked you out of that game, why my decisions are what they are. And hopefully your parents are listening. But again, this father, and this goes back probably back to 2012, his daughter ended up D1. She's terrific. I love her. Uh, he was fat mouth for me and it got back to me. So what I did was the kid that he was saying she was better than, I said, check rock. First one to five. She got spanked five zero. And I look at the dad. Now what, bro? Take your kid. But we're not going to play those games here. You're not going to be in the stands. First of all, if I hear of any of that, we out. And again, my naysayers say I can only do this because I'm in San Antonio. If I'm in Houston or Dallas or L.A., it would be so much more competition. I would run my program the same way. I run my program the same way when I got four D2s, like my first graduating class, compared to four All-Americans. Let me do my job or move around because parents break up organizations and it's college coaches. I never talked to college coaches about my daughter. They needed to tell Rosalie and Desiree, you go outgrow your daddy when it comes to this basketball. Yeah. He know the game. Yeah. He runs his program, but you go outgrow your dad. And we try to really enforce that in our program daily is that, 
yes, you may have played in the league, but oh, you're still looking from daddy goggles. You're still looking for mama goggles. I don't have a dog in that fight in regard to your kid. I'm going to be able to t- speak a different truth than you. So that's how we handle with the parents and just a lot of you are who's recruiting you. See, in the beginning, you could say, well, finest was underrated. Well, now we got everybody's attention. So if you plan in our program and you ain't getting no love, you are who's recruiting you. Uh, let me add you this, Ray, okay? Totally agree, but you set your boundaries. You're credible. You've been around a long time. Let's talk about a coach that maybe isn't as credible as you and may be concerned if that they've run their program that way that kids may leave. I know it's not a good Mark, excuse. you got to. Uh, I, okay, so that's where I'm at. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, again, that's where I'm wrong, right? But that's how it will always be. You know, it, it just is what it is. I run my program that way. If you have more say-so than me in regards to your kid with me, go start your own damn club. Of, get, get on. Yeah. Move around. Because I got to worry about 100 kids, not just your one kid. And it's different than guys. If I had a kid that I can get a piece of their contract, who knows, right? I don't know. I'm not in that position. What, what's the supermax? 250 mil? Maybe I would put up with more shit if I can get a piece of that 250 mil. But you're going to sell one book for me. Yep. Um, okay, so the, the takeaway from, from that, Ray, just all I'm going to make sure is that I like what you said because I used to do, the, and it was different for me back when my kids, my, my admirals were young, but I used to do the same because my wife would hear a lot from parents complaining, right? And she'd tell me stuff. I try not to, to make it, you know, really bother me. But at practice, I would do the same. I would say things loud enough where I'm speaking to the whole group, right? That hopefully mom and dad are listening over there because you've heard some stuff in the background. But I mean, I, I'm saying what I'm hearing is you have to take control of your program. And if you're more concerned about parents and you're not running your program, then you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Is that a fair statement? Not on the girl's side. Not, and not, and not again. I got a lot of naysayers about this. He's a jerk. He's an asshole. He's a tyrant, whatever. You got other options. I love capitalism. I love free enterprise. Deuces, I love you. And it's crazy because I'll talk better about you when you leave me. Okay. Uh, Ray, I mean, uh, Lupe, what you, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, shoot, Ray, hit, Ray hit right on the head on a lot of things. You know, um, you have some of it on the boys' side, right? You, you, you get the parent that, that gets back in the car and it's like, you know, the biggest part that we have on our side, every parent wants their kid to be the dude. Every parent thinks their guy, their kid is, is the guy, should be the guy. You know, so we can preach something and, and you, you can know, you know, right? Because they play the right way for a certain time. Kid gets a write-up. We say all the time, man, stop playing for write-ups. Like, stop playing for write-ups. Just fucking play. And so you'll, you'll notice, you'll tend to see some kids forcing some things, right? That's out of character from what, number one, they just can't do. And number, with, without, let me rephrase that, that they cannot do on their own outside the flow of the game. There's very few kids who can just go out there and just go get it. We all know that, right? And those are easy to spot. But the ones that we're trying to get to different levels and, and parents are saying, oh, my baby's a division one player. And, you know, you need to go out there and shoot as many times as kid, kid X and this. I'll have a conversation with the kid. I said, man, your parents can't fucking get you to school. They can't get you a scholarship. They can go cry all they want in that car. They can go make all the calls. They can do all the comments on Twitter and Facebook, everything they want to do. And so they buy a university or start one. They can't, they can't put you to school. All they're doing is being a detriment. I think it's generational. I really do. I, I think that for the next generation of kids that are probably in their 20s right now, right, that went through it. And I know some that parents were, man, my kids didn't. Some of them kids, man, we had in our program, their kids didn't even finish playing basketball. Like, they didn't play basketball in their high school careers, right, their junior seniors. They dropped off, and I don't know what they did, right? I think it becomes generational when they have their own kid, and they went through the process, say, man, maybe I should listen this time. Because, man, they were telling my dad I was D2, I was low major. My dad kept saying I'm mid-major, high major, burned me out, burned a lot of bridges. Because, man, this, this basketball community in the right, in the right circle is very small. Like, it's super small. There's a lot of people doing it that can't get in that circle and make certain phone calls to make shit happen and get you the answer you really want. 
from whether it's a scout, whether it's a division high major coach, mid major, low major, you know, uh, uh, somebody who does a lot of consulting for college coaches, et cetera. And, and now you take yourself out of that circle. It are, your chances are already tough to make, to get a college scholarship in basketball. Let's be honest. It's already extremely tough. And when you take yourself out of the people who have the resources and have your kid's best interest, because all you want to do is bad mouth or think your kid's better than the next kid, man, you're going to be taking out a lot of Pell Grants and loans. That's just the way the shit works. So you better just stay in line. And it might not be what you want to hear, but I do think it's generational. I think the next generation of kids, of parents that have kids that have gone through it, might listen a little better than, than, than the previous time because there wasn't as much education. There wasn't as much data. There wasn't as much, you know, social media and all this going around. That's just my take on it. That's a great point. Mark, let me just say real quick, quick example, Bobby Wenzel. Um, this morning, uh, his, his daughter played this weekend. One of the most recruited kids in the state got offered from Oklahoma State yesterday, you know, probably 10, what, a, 8 out of 10, Big 12, you know, has offered this kid. The kid is the real deal, top 50 kid in the country. Um, I called her this morning, and, and she had a pretty good tournament. She was special one game. Um, he played college basketball. His woman played college basketball, as you know, brother, over a red shirt over at uh, Utah. I do call. You know, when, when, when Lupe's in my program, I am going to call. So don't misinterpret that I don't cherish the elite players' parents, but if you let them run all over you, and I bring up Bobby Wenzel because he's been with me long enough to know he was a really rambunctious when he got with me. Hey, very opinionated. Hey, here's how we do things. Now he waits for me to call like I did this morning, very hectic day. Bobby, talk to me about this weekend. What do you see? What would you like to see? So we still go ahead and work with our parents. But if he was on the sideline bashing Sammy Wagner because Sammy Wagner looked off his daughter. No, we can't do that. That's when the parents start beefing and it burns up the entire culture. So that's what I want to make sure is that, yes, we get some input from parents, but your daughter better be pretty damn good. I like yep. people's tolerance, don't we? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. All right, let's shift gears to this. So question is, um, a lot of programs, boys and girls side, don't have many Division One players. So let's talk about programs that primarily have D2, more to the D3, because I know we'll talk mon monies in a little bit, because I know a lot of people have asked me questions, how does the money work, the difference between D1, D2, D3, et cetera. But let's talk about programs. What advice do you have for them or anything you can give them as far as if they have a bunch of kids that are, I don't say a bunch, but the, the majority of their kids are D3 and below, what, are they, what should they be doing? Um, as far as recruiting and how they should run their programs, those, those type things. Anyone you know, I, I think you, you need to, you want to go Ray? You want to, Ray, say something? My bad. I, I think I they need to tie themselves to, you know, the right events and the right resources that target those kids. There are, there's like, like Peter Swetland, he's the, probably the best, one of the best in the country for sure in the state of Texas when it, when it deals to division three kids. He deals with high academic division three kids. That is his niche. That's it. So you got to find what your niche is, right? If you've got mainly Division II, NEI, or Division three kids, you don't want to be on the same floor with the shoot team because those coaches aren't going to be recruiting your kids. So you need to go to the events and do your research of, like the Gasol. I mean, the Gasol has all, I, I think they have all levels. That's just my opinion, right? I think the Gasol does a good job of having all levels where they, they do a really good job of putting the teams that have the same type of players that are getting recruited on those levels against each other to make it easier for the college coaches to go view them. Sometimes directors of those type of programs can't get out of their own way because what they're trying to do is they're trying to compete with the Rays or trying to compete with the hard works or, you know, another shoot team and say, Man, I want to go try to beat them. You don't have the same type of kids. So you're doing your kid a disservice because yeah, you tell your parents, I have 50 kids, coaches in the stands, not one of them recruiting your kids. So that's a bad look. You know, so you need to put yourself and your kids in the camps and put them in the events and tournaments against the same type of teams that have your equivalent to your type of player. And if a director of an organization doesn't know what that is, then shit, you might want to take your kid out of that organization because that's not good. Yep, agreed. Uh, no, Lupus, to, to, Lupus totally right. I mean, um, first, let me say camps. I, I know that there's a camp coming up in San Antonio, and I'm not trying to be negative but a combine for the first time on the girl's side. Combine for what? 
your vertical leap. I mean, what are you doing? I mean, at the end of the day, if the person who's throwing the event doesn't have college connects, I call them queen makers. I used, I am one now, right? I talk to a lot of coaches daily about kids, even on the outside of my program. And, and, and if the person that's throwing the event doesn't have college coaching connects, you're wasting your time and your money. So camps are huge on our side. If you cannot get in front of a queen maker, don't go. Um, grades, huge over here, right? Title IX says that, you know, 60 football players, you got to make sure you're giving some of that money to the females. So you better have good grades. It's hard to get into the D3s and NAIAs. I would really stress the grades, persistence, resiliency. And it sounds uh, generic to say it, but it's not. You see a lot of kids that should be D1, D2, NAIA in the seventh grade. They lose focus by the time they're sophomore. It's the marathon. It's that tortoise that's going to win on the female side and where the majority of it, and it's like that, I'm sure, on the guy side, you have late signees. Now, yes, we have our D1 kids signing early, but get till May of your senior year because it's a battle of attrition on the female side. The turnover is bananas, not even uh, in regards to the portal. You know, JUCO, especially on the East Coast, they need roster spots. So if you just stay the course, you know, go to the right events, try to get to some East Coast stuff and get in front of the queen makers, that would be my advice um, in regards to those with the D2s, D3s, and NAIA programs. I, I think some what you guys are saying as well is some of the responsibility has to be on the kid. Like you can, you can have your program take you to tournaments and you hope they put them in front of coaches, but some kids, especially those low division two, threes, they need to be proactive and go to the right camps as well. Am I, am I hearing that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk. I want to just talk monies because a lot of people have asked me, how does the money work? I don't think they know. Parents may not know. Maybe some of these coaches don't know. How does it work from, let's just start with division two. And then the difference between division three, and then you got grants, financial aid, some academic things. Um, Cause I see a lot on social media, I know you guys too. I just got a full scholarship too. And it's like a, a JUCO, like, okay, um, let's, so I just, it's kind of a misleading. Yes, you may not be paying for school, but it doesn't mean you're getting a full athletic scholarship. So just kind of help educate folks on that. You want to go Luke, first, Ray? You, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Luke. Uh, I mean, yeah, so, you know, they're limited on scholarships right at every level. So what they'll do is they'll supplement, right? And, and Ray hit a good point that I didn't reach uh, touch on. And thanks for bringing that up, Ray, is academics is huge, right? Especially on those lower levels because they're able to pull money from academic money, right? So on the Division two level, you better have, you know, X amount of, of full scholarships. Then they're going to have some half scholarships and they're going to fulfill those half scholarships with some Pell Grants. You know, and there's some kids that might have you know, even on some Division two rosters that have take out loans. To, to make up the difference, you know, because uh, they're just not that good, right? They might be whether it's a ninth guy, tenth guy, whatever number it is. So a lot of that is a little misleading, you know, on the JUCO level. You say I got a full ride scholarship. A lot of it's Pell Grant, you know, so are they actually paying out of pocket? Maybe not. You know, I don't know everyone's situation, but a lot of it is not all going to be 100% covered from an athletic scholarship standpoint because they're not bringing in the money the, the, the Division One schools are, especially at the P5 level. So they don't have as much money to go around from an athletic budget standpoint. So they have to supplement a lot of that with academics and Pell Grants. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, Lou hit it. I mean, you know, 15 again scholarships on our side, D1. D2, I think, is 10 spread. You look at the La Red River Conference, um, canceling some stuff because of the so-called crisis. Ivy League just did it. Um, Mark. Loop, I just think is really getting ready to be interested on the female side and, 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 and teams having to honor Title IX. That's going to be interesting on the female side. So, again, the advice I would give to the parents that are listening um, is really concentrate on grants. Really get your academics high. You have to because we don't know if the revenue is going to be there when you stunt the men's program again, which subsidizes the females. Um, the the full ride deal, we do have full ride JUCOs, the um, the Jayhawk Conference. I know some of those kids, they don't may not get stipends, but pretty much everything is taken care of. But yeah, it is with some pale. 
Um, but again, these kids want to shine and say they got a full ride, so I ain't mad at them. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, Ray, I wanted to ask you this. I, I like what you did this year with your different teams. I know you got unanimous signature. I, I, if I'm wrong, I apologize. I think it's class act if I'm not mistaken, but I trained a few of those kids. I know they're very high academic kids. I, maybe I'm out of term. I don't think they're high major kids, possibly low major or in that division two, II, division three. Um, talk us through that. I'm, I'm hoping I got that information correct. Just in regards to why I did what I did, or what yeah. Mark? yeah, why did you do that, and why, why do you feel that was the the best thing to do for your teams when you were trying to figure out your rosters? Yeah, I had eighteen D ones, so eighteen D ones I could put the top twelve on one team. Nobody's happy. So what I did was split them up nine and nine. Now the problem is it, it, it gets my teeth kicked in when we play against a side fair um, without my top ten players because their top ten players. Um, are better than my top 10 players, but that's never been the case with me. I've just joined back on the circuit. Um, so having two, three SSB teams, I would have, I think, um, challenged for the, for the three SSB title. I think I win it if I put all 10 of my players on the same roster, but I know you train Bria McClure. Bria McClure is playing on my St. Lou team, which played this weekend. It's always been my top team. She's coming off the bench behind Ashley Jackson. Ashley Jackson added everybody. Baylor, UConn, six-foot point guard. The kid is special. Bria is just as special in her own lane. So it didn't make sense for me to have a Kiara Sanderlin, who is special in her own lane. A Bria McClure playing with a Sammy Wagner, who's already going to Baylor, and Ashley Jackson. So I try to do the best I could in regards to splitting them so each one can develop. You know, Treva Corrales, Tina Camacho, Jeff Chavin, you know, all these high school coaches that have kids within our program, it's my job to make sure that they're getting better for those high school programs and eventually college in the short amount of time that I have them and sitting on a bench ain't it. The class act, um, I'm very excited about that because I just see that's where the industry is going. Way more sub D1 kids. It's always been that way, but I see what's getting ready, to, I think, to dry up in terms of scholarships. So you train a Sid Sanderford, um, straight A student, just shoot the lights out of the ball. You know, not the most athletic, smaller guard. If she was on the East Coast, she would already have three NAIA offers. So at least with class act, I can go ahead and tell college coaches, everybody on this roster is a 3.75 at least. All of them have this on the SAT or ACT. This is a high academic kid, part of a high academic program. Recruit and treat them as such. Yeah, very smart. Uh, 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 Lupe, tell us about your rosters too. Um, I know you've got 17, 16, and a couple of – Six, another 16 second team and a 15th, I believe. We do. So uh, we've got a 17 u group. You know, we've got three kids from out of town, right? We've got, uh, you know, Manuel Basecki uh, committed to A&M. He's, you know, arguably number one, number two kid in Dallas. We've got the top kid in Houston, Ramon Walker, committed to U of H. And then uh, Joseph Van Zandt, who uh, Liberty got a steal from. And he's, shit, when he played this past weekend, I can't tell you, this last yeah. scrimmage, everybody, yeah. their brother was hitting me, how they were get to Liberty, but from Midland, Texas. And then the rest of the kids are local. You know, Jerome Corbett committed to LSU. Uh, Christian Green, who played at Cornerstone last year. Uh, Jay Sean Jackson, who's uh, who man's son, who's over at Wagner, and then Austin. That's that's our 17 new roster. Uh, so we, we do split. We split the 16s. Uh, it was led by Vince Iwachuku, you know, the seven-foot kid from Cole. Uh, we have two 16 new teams, so that 22 class is pretty big uh, in, in our organization. And so we have, we're going to have one on the circuit and one that, that and it brings up to the point we talked about earlier that has a lot of Division II NAIA type kids on there. And so we felt that having a, a Kevin Garcia, you know, Kevin Garcia is, is a really successful kid, young, you know, was shit, like, might be the best fifth grader I've ever freaking seen. You know, I mean, honestly, I mean, he's dominant. He's a big man in the post. I mean, he's dumping down the rules bucket every time. And uh, now he's a 6'4". Probably three, three guy, you know, three guard, you know, can't play. He's not gonna play at a high major division one level. He understands that. So, do I put him on my 16 U team where he just sits the bench and doesn't get to play a lot, or do I make him the dude, or one of the main guys on my second 16s? He goes to a gasso, and who knows? Maybe he gets a a couple of low majors get on him, right? But it's not gonna be the case if I have him on my top 16 U team. It just doesn't work that way. So, I had a conversation with him and. And uh, Boomer had a conversation with his mom, and that was the best feeling fit because guess what? Now he gets to go back to his high school. 
where he's been dominating and goes back with that same confidence rather than me having him on the bench loses confidence in himself and who knows now maybe he loses all chances and opportunities to play at the next level because mentally he's shot mentally he just man you know what man sitting on the bench and it does that to some kids um so that's the reason we did we split up the 16 u and then we have a 15 u group that's got some uh uh talented freshmen actually our two top freshmen play on our 16s and, and that's something that we do within our program is if we've got some kids that are really talented young we're not scared to play them up as you know, Austin played 16s as an eighth grader. He played 17s as a freshman. Uh, you know, Micah Peavy. You know, we put Micah Peavy on the stage as an eighth grader playing 16U. You know, so uh, the kid from Warren, Jalen Crocker, and uh, Zayn Height from uh, Smithson Valley, both those kids are, are freshmen playing in our 16U team because we feel that they have a chance to be mid-major plus kids. If you have a kid that has that chance, you got to play them up. That's our philosophy from high school. They got to get their dents in. They got to get – their ass kicked a little bit, and you find out really quick if it's form or it's not. And and they understand if you want to get to the level that those kids are at, this is the progression you've got to take. Yep. Hey, Mark. Hi, Rick. Real quick, Luke made a great point about playing up. You know, uh, I had a disagreement with somebody I really respect last week talking about the best team at a certain age level. And um, to me, that's partly what's wrong with the city. You know, a kid like Sammy Wagner is a 23. She was committed to Baylor in the eighth grade, world champion of Baylor in the eighth grade. She's never played her own age group. The elite ones rarely play their own age group, and it is fluid. You know, you take it by case by case basis, but I think as a city, we need to get away from trophy chasing and people who are supposed to be in the know making comments about that. Yes, winning is important. When you're in high school, you know, get the state. My job ain't to go out and win. I win four tournaments a year trying to chase. Now it's the Adidas circuit or it's the Super 64, which I've won. But that's not my job. My job is to help Sammy Wagner get to Reagan and contribute as she did from day one, being that she was in my program as a fourth grader, not what's the best 23 or 24 team in the city because those kids are playing their age level. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I was that was what I was going to close on. So it's kind of nice that we've slid into Sorry. it. The question was, no, you're good. So we just slid right into it. The question was is, when should kids play at their own age or when they should play up? I agree, it's case by case. Um, it but we can we can continue to dive in, dive into that. I, I um, think, you know, Mark, I, I think that it's feel – and it's experience of being around it. You know, Ray and I have been around kids that, that you play them up early and then they, they plateau and then they got to go back to play their own age group. So it does become fluid, right? It, it does no good at a young age, man. And, all, and a lot of it is is, is rankings and, and, and all you get early is you, you're playing for likes and comments. And that's where, that's where I think that youth basketball has really taken a big hit is that they load off these super teams, they go playing, and we did it. I, I'm telling you, I, I believe the class of 2022 is the one that, that started a trend. You know, back in fifth grade, we're flying these kids, shit, man, they went to like six states or something in fifth grade. You look back at it now, and I, I've got a six-year-old, I think he's ended up being a freaking skater, but whatever. I ain't doing that shit again. I ain't going to no damn six states with fifth graders. <laughs> it doesn't make no damn sense. But that was the movement then, right? It's kind of like, if you don't do it, you're going to fall behind. And then as you start, as you start to see the trends, it begins, you know what, we have a couple of kids, we need to play them up. And, and because once you're dominating at your grade, you need to play up, up with them where they can't physically get hurt. So we were very always, when the eighth grade is the toughest year, by the way, and I'll touch on that a little bit, to, to get kids to play up. That's the toughest, toughest, toughest grade. So once you can get a kid and move them up, and he's not going to get hurt, right? You got to be careful about that, you know, and you got to play against the right teams because you have some teams out there. They, man, we had a bunch of them, man. They take it personal. We get up 20 on them. We got some young kids. They want to whoop our ass and they're trying to hurt the kids, you know? So you got to be careful where you put them, how you do them. But it is important to play them. I'm a firm believer of it. Of it. I've done it. I did it with my own kid. I think it's been the best thing for them because when you have elite, especially elite kids, because it's easy for you to tell Mark, you've trained my son, right? You've trained my son, right? It's hard to get a kid to understand something until they failed at it. And once they've failed at it, if they really love it and they want to get to that next level, 
they're going to start trusting the people they trust, whoever parent, whatever parents put that person in front of to say, look, man, you can't do that when you get to this level. And when you put them in that situation and they fail, that keeps them working harder. That keeps them looking at something I got to go grasp for. Now, you want to bring them back and you go play in a national event where everybody's got the top players in the country. That's different. You can do that one or two times a year. You don't want to kill their confidence and play them up all the time and they don't have no success. So there is a balance. There's a really fine balance with that. You got to have to watch that balance. And it's a case to case basis. Some kids are mental midgets, unfortunately, at a young age. Others are more mentally stronger and they can be OK not having a bunch of success uh, playing at, at a level of one or two or three up. But uh, I think it's definitely something that needs to happen if you want elite kids to ever get to where they should be without any kind of broken dreams or false promises. Yep, I agree. Hey, Loop hit it on the head. Loop hit it. When he said fail, I would think at the young ages, at least in my experience, at least 60% of your games are you're playing to fail. You know, I, We play against boys. I had Lupe daughter playing against boys. We know we're going to lose. And to me, that's an easy out for me. Because when we're playing against boys, we expect to lose. So when we do well, it's a plus, And we can fall or fail in progress. You better have your parents on your team know playing up. Because when you play to fail and not chasing trophies and beating teams and pressing teams up 30, your parents going to start yapping. He can't coach. He should have did this. He should have did that. That's the concern if you do not have a strong organization with playing up. But that's where the education process works. You know, Lupe can attest to this is we'll come from a tournament and I'll send out a page of this is why I did this. This is the progress that I saw to try to keep people up to speed as to my why. And to be honest, I'm not doing that so much as of late. I did a lot of that when I started early. So advice to the early guys would be that let your parents know why you're playing up. It sucks on that ride home while we got beat by 20 and they're questioning every move you had. It'll work in the long run. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's the kid that just needs basketball to get out of some negative situations at home, they need to play for joy. They need to play to get away from the hell that they're living in. Totally different dynamic of that kid who has the markings of a P5 in the fifth grade she needs to get beat up. You take this weekend, I had Bobby Wenzel, who volunteered to take Bella Flemings. Bella Flemings is a 2026. She is, she has all the markings of a future All-American. And again, culturally, it was Bobby Wenzel, whose daughter stays on the phone all day, every day, volunteering to take her to go sit on the bench. She played five minutes the entire weekend. Now, can't do a whole season of that with her. But I wanted her to get a chance to see that even level. Yep. Um, all right, let me add this. To, to, to add to this, uh, this may hurt some souls. It's okay because I see it a lot. i um, seen a lot over years. What about a kid that needs to play up but their team can't play up? So I'm talking possibly younger. Let like the kid to go. Yeah, let the kid okay. Go. All right. But kid. that's <laughs> – yep, that's no, easy, easier said than done, right? We always say that. Let, let the kid go. But I know there's many coaches on it. We've seen it all the time. There's a kid that is dominating, not getting better, probably playing out of position, whatever. But they're winning. But but this is what some teams will do. They'll play the whole team up. So is that that's something that's that's hurting the, the every kid? It is. That that, that's the problem. That's the problem with San Antonio. Yep. And not even San Antonio. It's the problem all over. It's a problem. They have the same problems in Dallas and Houston. Like once again, the difference is they've got more of them, and, and, and you know it's a bigger volume and a bigger uh, pull to pull pitch from. You have to let them go, right? If if you if you have an organization and you're a director and you got a backbone and you have and you believe in what you do, then you don't you shouldn't have to worry about anything because at that point you know what you go to a rave, you come to someone like like myself or a Lou or, or you know someone who, who plays in, in in big events and say, hey man, I got a kid, I can't do nothing for him. KJ Adams, Colton Benson, when I had them, I got them from a, a guy to Austin. In seventh grade, I remember, and and we played them in the AAS, and they upset us. We fucking beat us in the championship. We had that loaded team with Langston, and I forgot what I had on that team, and, and, and we were really good. And they upset us, and they beat us. The dude calls me the next Monday and says, hey, man, I, I can't ever do that again, and I can't do nothing else for these kids. 
he knew how to stay in his lane and says, I'm going to send you KJ Adams and Colton Benson. I'm thinking, so what? You just beat me. But he understood it. He got it. But he stayed in his lane. He's got a very successful organization in Austin. He does a good job with it. And he stayed in his lane. So if, if you're confident in staying in your lane, man, it's tough to be in the lanes that Ray and I are in. Ray will tell you that it's tough. That's not, it's not what everybody thinks it is. Oh, you got to shoot. You're not bullshit. You have no idea. It's a shark tank. It's a shark tank dealing with what we have to deal with. And so by you letting that kid go and just staying in your lane, because you're right, you hit the biggest one on the head, Mark. Usually it's probably around fourth to seventh grade. It's a bigger athletic kid that's playing the four and the five, that's grabbing it off the rim, going coast to coast, and laying it up over everybody. He should really be learning how to play the one or the two and never ends up in college and ends up being one of these, unfortunately, kids that doesn't ever live up to his full potential because he's played out of position so long to somebody that held on to him so long. And we, you can have a whole segment on this, but it's – and so those directors – and I think it's a lot of insecurity, man. I'll be honest with you. There's some guys that are really insecure – I let this dude go, man. I might lose my program because he's my token kid. But you're not doing anything for the kid. And you're not helping the other kids by playing them up because they're not ready to play up. Ray, you want to piggyback on it? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it may be different on the boys' side because there are plenty of routes, right? Uh, I agree with what Luke is saying, but you look at a Weber State for Miller. You know, he didn't have to go to a P5. So I think guys are maybe look at Kawhi Leonard. You know, he didn't play for a juggernaut shoe program and uh, grassroots um, in L.A. Or, or the I.E. and then went to San Diego State. So I think it's a little bit different um, from this side. I think over here, I said this and I wasn't trying to be pompous, um, it'll all shake out if the parents want what's really right for their children. What I see on the girl's side is if a parent is staying out of loyalty to a program that's not helping their kid. They know something about their kid that we don't know. That kid ain't mentally tough because that parent is a worshiper. I rarely see young females pan out to be what they're supposed to be if their parents worship them. And that's what I see in a lot of these programs that have these parents with the trophies and they name kids' name. I love it. Great job. Way to support. But if your kid is dominating at that level and you don't want to put them in a bigger environment so they can fail and really get some heat, you're worshiping them, which is okay because they're still going to end up going to school, right? If they're good enough to really get it in in the eighth, ninth grade, they may not maximize their potential and end up P5, D1, D2, but they'll go somewhere if they just stay the course. You don't need to be with a program like mine. But mental toughness. If you are raised in a soft environment where you always win, your coach kiss your ass, your parents think you walk on water, you don't belong on this side anyway. All right, so last question, we'll close. Does it, it maybe both, but does it does that fall under the coach or the director or the parent? We're talking about an individual case where the kid probably needs to leave based on talent, whatever. Is that is that up to the coach director or is it up to the parent? And and if if because there'd be parents on here listening that maybe they want to make the move, and how do they go about that? So is it both or is it more onus on the on the coach or the director? What do y'all think? Look, can I jump in? Go ahead, bro. This is how they're doing it on the girls' side now. And Mr. Jackson, bless his soul, rest in peace, uh, Marcus Jackson, the DFW League founder, legend of a man. I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with him, but just those small moments, he left a big impact on me. And he talked to me about what he did with Odyssey Sims. And congratulations to her. I saw her new baby uh, this weekend. Um, you know, it's Texas legend, WNBA player. Um, he, he brought in the Fort Worth Frogs or something like that. And on that team, you'll get an Ariel Atkins, WNBA starter, Odyssey Sims, good organization, good grassroots organization, but you end up taking on an organization to grab two or three players. And he told me this. That was his MO back in the days, and that's what's really happening now. So if you got an elite kid and you in San Antonio and you're scared to lose that kid, then you calling up some club in Dallas or Houston saying, save me. Let me wear your name. Let me wear your jersey because I'm going to end up losing this kid anyway. That's what I'm starting to see more and more, and I'm not saying anything is wrong with it. That's what I think the remedy is for some clubs. 
point. I mean, and you'll see some of that on the boys' side, the same thing. You know, you, you'll see that uh, uh, some other club organizations popping up around Austin and, and uh, San Antonio. They're coming out of Dallas or Houston. What the everyone fails to acknowledge is that team's never going to play on that respected circuit, whatever shoe circuit it is. They're going to pluck the one or two kids that's the player and put them on their top teams. But Absolutely. for them, it, it, for them, it keeps them relevant long enough to either figure it out or just say, man, I had this kid all the way through. And then when it's time to let, let's say, let him go, that's kind of the unwritten rule. It's like, okay, cool, man. I'll give you some gear and you use my name. But, you know, when that stud gets to 16 or 17, he's got to come play on this top team over here and I can't take all your other kids, right? How many of those conversations are being had with those parents? I, I can't speak on that. I think it's on both, man. I think it is on the parent, man. I, I'm one, and I've always said this, and, and both of y'all guys know me well, I can only speak for one kid in my organization. It's the one that lives in my freaking house. And I've always said that, right? So I'm always going to make a decision. And, and we usually, I mean, we, excuse me, we run our program as a parent decision-based program first, you know, so because I'm a parent, Blue Man's a parent. And so I'm going to make the best decision that I think that's best for my kid. And I think parents need to take some responsibility for it. You see a lot of parents do kind of push it back on the director on some, on some major decisions like that. Have a, have a conversation and say, hey, look, can you get my kid to this level? And if that coach goes, oh, yeah, for sure I can. Well, man, can you call a couple of these coaches? Because the director can call the coach and put them on speakerphone and talk to the parent. That's legal, you know, depending on what grade he's in. The coach just can't call the parent or the kid, you know, and say, hey, look, I, I know, have you seen this player playing? So I've never seen him. I'm going to send you some film. Can I follow up with you in a week, right, and, and get that same coach on the phone? And, then, man, you know, what do you think? Now, you know, granted, if, if, if you're really involved, you can have a coach freaking say what you steer him the way you want to steer him to keep to keep the kid, but that usually doesn't happen in the, the low major level of below. That happens at the high major, mid major plus high major level where, where it just does. So that's one way to know, you know, man, is, can this director really help my kid? And at that point, sometimes it's hard because a lot of directors and, and parents are good friends. I mean, I've had a lot of good friends in our organization for kids doesn't play for us no more and vice versa. I don't know, Mark, you've gone through that before. I'm sure Ray has as well. I mean, it's, it's a business. And, and the parents need to understand if, if you as a parent want to put your kid in the best possible situation, ask someone who has resources and give you a straight answer. It might not be the answer you want to hear, but it's the right answer. And that probably there can give you some guidance of what you should do with your child. Yep. Good stuff. Mark, can I just piggyback? Yep. Yep. End it. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I know what Lupe and Boo Man do for other organizations. And I think I do the same. Um, I think anytime you're in a prominent position, you're going to have naysayers. But I went to a Final Four party with Ryan Silver and watched Lupe and Boo Man embrace every San Antonio coach outside of hard work that showed up at that party. When D1 coaches come here, I invite Vaz with SA Hoops Elite. I invited Jared with Bia. I talk to people about what Devon is doing. I think the problem is, is that when you look at what we're doing as an, a, a barrier to your success as a club coach, that's the wrong way to look at it. The better the city is, the more hard work gets pub, the more their players benefit. And it's the same way over here on the girl side. So I think what Loop is talking about is you really care about the kid. I agree wholeheartedly. Put him in the right positions. But to me, more importantly, hit us. Ask us, do we know some NAIAs and D2s looking for kids? And understand, stop trying to say, come play for me because we're competitive against hard work. Hard work is hard work right now. We're cool in our lane. We're successful in our lane. Let me hit Loop. Let me hit Boo Man to help us get our kids in school. To me, that should be the point of view in the city, and I don't think it is that way as much as it should be. I agree. I was going to add that, too. To, to do, I was going to ask, do, co do coaches in the city hit you up talking about their kids? I imagine not enough. Fair statement? Not enough. But I do have some directors on the boys' side that, you know, I, I speak a lot to Lou, to Vasse. You know, I would say those two uh, are off the top of my head that, that I have conversations with quite often about kids and, 
and different events we're in or whatever the case is. And, but, you know, uh, no, I mean, honestly, and, and, and we're resources. I am. I'm never going to turn a guy down and just trying to help a kid out. And I'll give him a number and I'll put him in a group text with the coach and say, hey, man, it's a local kid. And I'm, I'm transparent. I might have never seen the kid play. I'm not going to say I have seen the kid play. I'm not going to say what level he is, but I can give you a phone number and at least get you on the phone with somebody that can give you that evaluation. Same with you, Ray. Man, Mark, I guarantee Lupe at least has a at least third, right? A third of his calls come from college coaches, and it ain't about his kids. Lupe, I know you've seen this kid. I know you played against. It's the same way here. I don't want to yay me it, but I can go on and on and on about San Antonio kids. I promise you, if 90% of the coaches are – recruiting a kid here, at some point they're going to tap in. And that's what's negative about some of the outside influences that would try to pit me against an Antonio Holmes, who does a terrific job with his hoops program, a Devon. And that, that's definitely a young one that's really not only up and coming, but he reaches out and asks for advice and we'll go get breakfast. And, you know, Vaz knows his stuff. You know, he runs a really successful program. I'm not saying we have a, a – a negative environment, but I see as people start to get involved in here, especially outside clubs that are coming here, setting up franchises, they're doing a disservice to the kids with that. And I'm going to piggyback real quick, Mark, before we get off. And it's funny, Ray said that right after our scrimmage, there's a kid who's elite hat. I never seen the kid play. He makes a move. I look at Peter, who the hell is this guy? Man, immediately afterwards, I hit five uh, uh, schools. You know, a couple in the Southland and uh, I forgot one of the conference head coaches that I know. I said, hey, man, you got to take a look at this kid. This kid can pretty play. And it reminds me of this kid you have on your roster, you know. And, I mean, it was one of those kids. You know, I mean, we're here for kids at the end of the day, right? I think people get 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 it, you know, uh, the competitiveness and, and, you know, I beat you, you beat me. At the end of the day, if we can help a kid, we're all three of us are on this call to educate people to help kids at the end of the day. Yep, totally agree. I'm glad you both said that because – I think the three of us were strong personalities, but a lot of people, we, our, circle, our, our circle is pretty small, but I think a lot of people outside looking in think that they can't reach out to us for those certain things. So I'm glad you both touched on that because that's something really positive to end this interview with is if you have a girl, raise your guy. If you got a boy, Lupe is your guy. I'm here to help whatever, but it is, it's all about kids. And that's what we're all about on this phone call. That's something we have in common. We may have our differences, but one thing that's common with the three of us is we want to help San Antonio basketball and help kids. So I'm glad we ended it on that. Appreciate you guys taking the time. Ray, I'm, I'm sure you're wiped out, man. I'm looking forward to your tournament this weekend. If, for anyone listening, they'll be out at the Sportsplex and the Gervin for their high school groups, and then the middle school stuff will be at the factory. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys out there. Appreciate y'all. Ray, I need, a, I need a VIP seat, uh, Gucci. I need uh, feet on wood, man. By the way, I'll be there tomorrow at 11. Hey, I got limited tickets because of the crisis we're in. I can't let you in, bro. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate y'all. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you. you guys. All right, we'll take take care of season.